Hi, Tam of the Scove here, and we'll start the forecast by recapping the M flare that occurred on June 21st. Now the reason why we're going over that flare is not only because it was incredibly massive, as you can see from the composite images, but also because it spawned a coronal mass ejection, and that ejection spawned a radiation storm at Earth. Now there was a question of whether or not this coronal mass ejection would actually cause a geomagnetic storm at Earth, and as you'll see later, some of the prediction models actually uh, con contradicted one another. Now if we look at what happens after the flare occurs, after the CME lifts off the sun, we see these post-flare coronal loops with plasma rain. And if you look at stereo B, this is behind the east limb, bam, there goes the flare. And again, you can see the post-coronal arcades just beginning to fill in. And now I'm showing you 171 angstroms because it maps out the coronal field lines very well. There goes the ejection right there. And now what you're looking at are the post-flare coronal arcades rebuilding. And if you look closely, they resemble a slinky that's aligned vertically. And the orientation of that slinky really does have a lot to do with whether or not we're actually going to have an effect at the Earth. Now switching to coronagraphs, this is a difference image from LASCO, and you can see this structure is extremely extensive. You can tell by the red dashed line that it extends more than 180 degrees of the field of view. What that usually means is that the thing is partially Earth-directed because it's a partial halo. Indeed, when we look at predictive models, you can see this structure really does extend almost 120 degrees out in longitude, and you can see it hitting Earth right there. But about six hours later, another prediction was put out. And this time, the CME doesn't hit Earth at all. Hey, it doesn't even graze Earth. So which one is it? This one or this one? A lot has to do with the orientation of that slinky. If that slinky had been oriented horizontally as opposed to vertically, we probably would have seen this scenario and gotten a geomagnetic storm instead of this scenario, which is what we got. So we didn't get a geomagnetic storm from this event, but we did get a radiation storm. And as you can see, the levels got up to that dashed line, which caused NOAA to issue an S1 mild radiation storm alert. Now once that CME passed us, you can see the radiation storm begins to die down. And as of the end of today, it's almost down to baseline levels. Now when the storm was in full swing, as you can see, it's really the high latitudes that get hammered, both the North and the South Pole, which is why I say, if you, at all possible, avoid high latitude and high altitude airline flights for the duration of these storms, especially if you're pregnant, just to be safe. So what can we expect for our space weather over the next week? Well, that cluster of active regions is finally moving off to the West Limb. And although we expected to see a lot of activity, the spots there are really stable, so we really haven't seen much in the way of activity at all. Now we have several new spots. We have 1777 and 78 coming on board, and that's where you saw those M flares, but those regions have since stabilized, so we're not expecting any more significant activity from active region 77 or 78. Now the real story is the coronal hole that's been rotating into view over the past few days. That coronal hole has now reached center disk, and we should expect some high-speed solar wind hitting the Earth around the 27th all the way maybe through the 29th. Prediction models right now are showing a shock uh, hitting us on the 29th, which means maybe a geomagnetic storm is in our future. But here's another interesting story. If you look closely at this picture here, you see a coronal mass ejection lifting off very, very slowly off of the northeast quadrant of the Sun. Now this structure is somewhat of a mystery because it was almost invisible as it left the disk with no flare, no fanfare, and basically nobody caught it. Now if we go to coronagraph images, this is LASCO at six solar radii. You can see the tip of that thing off the top limb, but what happens? The chronograph freezes. There are no images. And here's out to 30 solar radii. Again, we only get part of the story here. You see something coming off the bottom. You see something coming off the top. Is it a halo? I don't know. So what do we do in times like these? We go to the chronographs on stereo. Now this is stereo B. And sure enough, you can see that ejection lifting off the northwest quadrant. But what orientation is it? Is it pointing toward the Earth? It's really hard to tell. Now when we blow it up, you can see the loop-like structure there. It does give us some kind of hint on what the orientation is, but it's really difficult to tell. So we're kind of flying blind. However, if we go back to the image of the coronal hole, we get a hint of what's going to happen. You can see the filament rotating on the northeast part of the disk, and it's sitting just north of that coronal hole. And if you watch it closely, you can see it erupt. 
and when it erupts, it actually takes part of the plasma covering that coronal hole with it. After the eruption, you can see that finger extends a lot further than it used to. Now what that means is that the coronal hole plasma and that CME are inexorably linked together and they'll probably both reach the Earth at the same time. So from the 27th to the 29th, at the very least expect unsettled conditions to maybe a minor geomagnetic storm and if we get an extra kick from a CME that's lurking out there and it does hit Earth, we might boost us up to a moderate geomagnetic storm with aurora that could come far south as mid-latitudes and of course all of the communication disruptions that go along with it. I'm Tamitha Scove, thank you for watching.